بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كتاب أنزلناه إليك مبارك ليدبروا آياته وليتذكروا الألباب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم حاميم كذلك يوحي إليك وإلى الذين من قبلك الله العزيز الحكيم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وهو العلي العظيم تكاد السماوات يتفطرن من فوقهن والملائكة يسبحون بحمد ربهم ويستغفرون لمن في الأرض ألا إن الله هو الغفور الرحيم والذين اتخذوا من دونه أولياء الله حفيظ عليهم وما أنت عليهم بوكيل وكذلك أوحينا إليك قرآنا عربيا لتنذر أم القرى ومن حولها وتنذر يوم الجمع لا ريب فيه فريق في الجنة وفريق في السعير ولو شاء الله لجعلهم أمة واحدة ولكن يدخل من يشاء في رحمته والظالمون ما لهم من ولي ولا نصير أم اتخذوا من دونه أولياء فالله هو الولي وهو يحيي الموتى وهو على كل شيء قدير وما اختلفتم فيه من شيء فحكمه إلى الله ذلكم الله ربي عليه توكلت وإليه أنيب فاطر السماوات والأرض جعل لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا ومن الأنعام أزواجا يذرأكم فيه ليس كمثله شيء وهو السميع البصير له مقاليد السماوات والأرض يبسط الرزق لمن يشاء ويقدر إنه بكل شيء عليم شرع لكم من الدين ما وصى به نوحا والذي أوحينا إليك وما وصينا به إبراهيم وموسى وعيسى أن أقيموا الدين ولا تتفرقوا فيه كبر على المشركين ما تدعوهم إليه الله يجتبي إليه من يشاء ويهدي إليه من 
وَمَا تَفَرَّقُوا إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْعِلْمُ بَغْيًا بَيْنَهُمْ ولولا كلمة سبقت من ربك إلى أجل مسمى لقضي بينهم وإن الذين أورثوا الكتاب من بعدهم لفي شك منه مريب فلذلك فادع واستقم كما أمرت ولا تتبع أهواءهم وقل آمنت بما أنزل الله من كتاب وأمرت لأعدل بينكم الله ربنا وربكم لنا أعمالنا ولكم أعمالكم لا حجة بيننا وبينكم الله يجمع بيننا وإليه المصير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل الله يحييكم ثم ثم يميتكم ثم يجمعكم إلى يوم القيامة لا ريب فيه ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون ولله ملك السماوات والأرض ويوم تقوم الساعة يومئذ يخسر المبطلون وترى كل أمة جاثية كل أمة تدعى إلى كتابها اليوم تجزون ما كنتم تعملون هذا كتابنا ينطق عليكم بالحق إنا كنا نستنسخ ما كنتم تعملون فأما الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات فيدخلهم ربهم في رحمته ذلك هو الفوز المبين وأما الذين كفروا أفلم تكن آياتي تتلى عليكم فاستكبرتم وكنتم قوما مجرمين وإذا قيل إن وعد الله حق والساعة لا ريب فيها قلتم ما ندري ما الساعة قلتم ما ندري ما الساعة إن نظن إلا ظنا وما نحن بمستيقنين وبدا لهم سيئات ما عملوا وحاق بهم ما كانوا به يستهزئون وقيل اليوم ننساكم كما نسيتم لقاء يومكم هذا وقيل اليوم ننساكم كما نسيتم لقاء ومأواكم النار ومأواكم النار وما لكم من ناصرين ذلكم بأنكم اتخذتم آيات الله هزوا وغرتكم الحياة الدنيا فاليوم لا يخرجون منها ولا هم يستعتبون فلله الحمد رب السماوات ورب الأرض رب العالمين 
وله الكبرياء في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Blessed be he in whose hands is the dominion and in front of whom even the sun and moon have bowed. He it is who causes the earth to sprout with vegetation and sends rain down from the cloud. He revealed to us a reminder and revelation, verses that are recited and reviewed out loud. We ask for his mercy as we walk with life on this earth and when our bodies will be placed in a shroud. And we plead for admittance to paradise where only those given permission by him shall be allowed. Today, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to be doing four surahs and every day we're going to be doing more and more as we wind up closer to the end. And uh, all of these four are the Hawamim surahs from the Hamims that we mentioned yesterday. And all of these, as we said, are mid to mid late Makki surahs and they have some level of overlap even though each one has a particular facet or theme. So all of the Hawamim surahs, we said there are seven in number, there is quite a lot of overlap in content and yet each one of them takes a separate angle or tangent. And we're gonna begin with Surat Ashura. And Surat Ashura is uh, six pages, again all of these are Makki, 53 verses. And it is the only surah in the Quran that begins with Hamim Ayn Seen Qaf. And it is called Shura, which means consultation, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Muslims to consult with one another before undertaking a decision in verse 38. The main theme of the surah, along with the usual Meccan uh, themes, is to clarify the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it goes into a lot of detail regarding Tawheed and regarding proving the Day of Judgment. Also, one of the main sub-themes or sub-motifs of Surat Ashura is the concept of rizq or sustenance and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving sustenance and however Allah chooses to give to whomever He chooses to give. So as for the theme of revelation, that this revelation is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is clearly one of the main themes of the surah and we see it in a number of verses. The surah begins uh, with this theme, verse number three, and this is how we have inspired you and those before you, that Allah Azza wa Jal is indeed the Almighty and the All Wise. Verse number seven, and thus have we inspired you with an Arabic Quran that you may warn the mother of all cities. So Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, we have revealed to you the Arabic Quran so that you can warn the mother of all cities or the central city or the main city of this world. And of course, that is uh, the city of Mecca and all the cities around uh, Mecca. In verse 13, he has prescribed for you the same religion that he has prescribed for Nuh and he, have, he has inspired to you the same that he has inspired to Ibrahim and to Musa and to Isa. What is it? An That you shall uphold this religion, establish this religion and do not be divided uh, between yourselves with regards to this religion. Verse number 17, Allahu الذي anzal kitab Allah is the one who has revealed this book. So, so many verses are talking about the book and the revelation and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the clear guidance to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As for the other sub theme, which is that of rizq and wealth, again, this is very clear. So many verses regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala providing sustenance. Verse number 19, Allahu latifun bi'ibadi. Allah azza wa jal is latif. And latif means a merciful kindness that is nourishing, that is taking care of. Allah azza wa jal will take care of His servants in a kind manner. Yarzuqu man yasha. He provides for whomever He wills. And He is indeed the qawi and the aziz. Then Allah azza wa jal says, Man kana yuridu hawth dunya Whoever wants the hawth, uh, man kana yuridu hawth al-akhirah. Whoever once, excuse me, the harth of the hereafter, we shall increase his uh, harth here means of course, um, the share, it means the harvest. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving a metaphor. The metaphor is that of the farmer who is harvesting crops. So if you want the crops of a particular field, you had better be planting the seeds, taking care of that field. So Allah is saying, if you want the crops of the hereafter, we will increase those crops. 
And whoever wants the crops or the harvest of this world, we shall give him all that he desires, but he shall not have anything of the hereafter. And again, it's very straightforward. You know, it sometimes surprises me that why uh, do people find this problematic? The one who never desired Allah, the one who never desired the pleasure of Allah, why when this person passes away, do people presume that he might get it? The one who intentionally rejected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who turned his back to the worship of Allah. Of course, we speak in generalities, not specifics, but anyone, generally speaking, who turns away from all types of religion and religiosity, anyone who denies the existence of a creator, that is simply too big of an arrogance that really, generally speaking, cannot be forgiven, unless obviously a person repents before death. That is a separate issue altogether. So Allah is saying, if you desire the hereafter and you plant the right seeds for the hereafter, I will make that crop flourish, and I will give you much more than what you actually planted. And whoever wanted this dunya, you will get it. Okay, and notice Allah didn't say He's gonna make it more. You desire this world, you work for this world, guess what, you will get this world. But then, don't be surprised, you didn't want the akhirah, so you're not going to get the akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also informs us in this surah of why He chooses to give some wealth and others He does not give. Verse number 27, وَلَوْ بَسَطَ اللَّهُ الرِّزْقَ لِعِبَادِهِ لَبَغَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ If Allah were to simply hand out all of the risk that He wanted to, or that His servants wanted, then they would have transgressed on this earth. وَلَكِنْ يُنَزِّلُ بِقَدَرٍ مَا يَشَاء But rather, Allah Azza wa Jal sends down in precise amounts and measurements to those whom He chooses. Surely, regarding His servants, He is indeed an expert uh, and an observer. The point here, Allah is saying, if I were to just give everyone what they desired, they would have transgressed. They would have acted in a very evil manner. And so Allah chooses to give how much, and Allah Azza wa Jal is in, in, in the end of the uh, day, the one who decides for a benefit to the person uh, that is giving, getting that blessings. And Allah says in verse 49, لِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ To Allah belongs the kingdom of the heavens and the earth. He creates what He wills. He grants daughters to whomever He wills, and He grants sons to whomever He pleases. أَوْ يُزَوِّجُهُمْ ذُكْرَانًا وَإِنَاثًا Or He shall pair them together, giving a couple both sons and daughters. وَيَجْعَلُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ عَقِيمًا And some He renders to have no children. Indeed, He is knowledgeable and all-powerful. SubhanAllah, just like Allah assigns wealth and Allah assigns money, so too Allah assigns families. Some families, some parents, they only have daughters, and some parents, they only have sons, and some they have sons and daughters, and some they don't have any children. And each one of them, they could not predict, they do not know. It is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And notice Allah says that He is indeed the knowledgeable one. He knows who to give what, and He knows what is best for every single situation. Now this does not mean obviously, that we don't make dua for what we want. We continue to make dua till the day that we die. We continue to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at some level, we also accept Allah's qadr, that we desire, and if we don't get it, we understand that Allah azza wa jal's will is more important and more knowledgeable than our desire. So Allah azza wa jal informs us, He is the one who decides and everything happens by His qadr. The surah as well, has a beautiful description of the righteous, of the believers. Verse number 36 onwards, that uh, Allah says, وَمَا أُتِيتُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَمَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Whatever you have been given, it is of the temporary provisions of this world. But whatever Allah Azza wa Jal possesses, that is better and more everlasting for those who believe, وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ And those who rely on their Lord. الَّذِينَ يَجْتَنِبُونَ كَبَائِرَ الْإِثْمِ وَالْفَوَاحِشِ The believers are those who rely on their Lord, avoid the major sins, avoid indecencies, وَإِذَا غَضِبُوا هُمْ يَغْفِرُونَ And when they become angry, that is when they forgive. You know when you're calm, when you're collect, it is easy to forgive. Allah praises that when you're, when you're in a state of anger, that is when you find it in you to forgive other people. Verse number 38, وَالَّذِينَ اسْتَجَابُوا لِرَبِّهِمْ And those who obey the call to their Lord, وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةِ And they establish the prayer regularly, 
regularly وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورًا بَيْنَهُمْ And they conduct their affairs by mutual consultation وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ And they give from what we have provided them. So anytime there is a major decision, whether you are a head of state or whether you are the head of the household, whether you are the president or the prime minister, or whether you are a person who is just doing anything that will influence and affect you and people around you. It is sunnah, it is recommended, it is of the ways you get Allah's blessings, it is embodying the values of a sensible person that you get the advice of other people. And you listen to what they say. And then of course, you also pray istikhara, which is another uh, topic altogether. And then after these two, istishara and istikhara, then you make your decision. Our scholars have said, whoever does istishara and istikhara will never be disappointed. So the Quran tells us, وَأَمْرُهُمْ shura بَيْنَهُمْ And shura means mutual consultation. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, anytime he had a major decision, he would call the Sahaba to the masjid and he would ask, them, what do you think I should do? He did that at Badr, he did that at Uhud, he did that at Ahzab, every single time, and he is getting the shura. And in fact, if you look at the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, he even took shura from his wife, Umm Salama, and then he followed her advice. Husbands, take shura from your wives. Wives, take shura from your husbands. All of you, take shura from one another, and get advice, and see, get other perspectives as well. And so Allah says that the believers, they take their affairs by mutual consultation. And, uh, and one of the characteristics as well, and they continuously are charitable uh, to others. And then verse 39, those who, when they have been wronged, they defend themselves. That no problem, if you have been wronged, you can get some help, you can get other people to help you in this regard. You get the law involved, you get other people involved in manners that are legitimate to do so. Then Allah says, وَجَزَاءُ سَيِّئَةٍ سَيِّئَةٌ مِثْلُهَا If somebody does a wrong to you, you can do a wrong back unto them. If somebody says something mean and nasty to your face, you are allowed to say an equivalent, an equivalent, it's allowed, it's not something there. Then the very next Next verse or the very next phrase, فَمَنْ عَفَى وَأَصْلَحَ Whoever forgives and then whoever reconciles and makes up, فَأَجْرُهُ عَلَى الله. His reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verily, Allah does not love the one who is unjust. So this is the beauty of our religion. There is a spectrum. When somebody does wrong unto you, there is a spectrum of permissible reaction. The very bottom of permissibility is you do the same amount of wrong unto them. They they said something bad, you say something bad as well. And if you do so, neither are you sinful, nor are you going to be held accountable, nor are you going to be rewarded. It's a complete neutral thing. He did bad, you did bad, exact same, but it has to be the exact same, and it has to be uh, mean permissible as well, meaning obviously uh, so something that involves blood or something of this nature, you need to go to the court and do justice over there. But some verbal altercation or something of this nature, then you can defend yourself verbally back uh, in a manner that is the same as him. However, Allah says, if you forgive, that is even better, and Allah will give you the reward. And then the highest level, if you forgive and you make up, you reconcile, you be soft and you come back to that level of friendship or kinship or brotherhood, that is the highest level. And that is something that only the righteous, the, 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 the ones who are the muttaqeen are able to uh, do. And that's what Allah Azza wa Jal praises in this section of the uh, Quran. Before we move on to the next uh, surah and conclude this surah, two verses that play a very prominent role in our theology in this surah, Surah Shura. Uh, verse number 11 is one of the most important verses uh, that is used by all the various uh, sects in Islam, the various theologies of Islam. Islam, like all the religions of this world, it has different interpretations, whether we like it or not, it exists, we have to deal with it. And uh, the biggest point of contention for the first 800 years of our tradition has been regarding the divine attributes and how we understand the divine attributes. Many were the groups that were formed. And again, much can be said, and I have to force myself back here. This is my area of expertise. This is what my PhD is in. My entire area of expertise is Islamic theology, and in particular, uh, the development of sectarianisms and whatnot. Uh, and uh, this topic of the divine attributes, uh, so many different interpretations. How do we understand when Allah says He has risen over the throne? When Allah says He created Adam with both of His hands? When Allah says He is this and that? How do we understand this? And this whole concept or controversy began when Muslims entered uh, the lands of Christians, Damascus and other areas, and they heard the 
uh, Christological debates, the nature of Christ versus God. How do we understand who Christ is versus who God is? And how do we understand the attributes of Christ? And so when the Muslims began hearing this, it kind of absorbed into them. They began discussing what does the kalam of Allah, what is the speech of Allah? How do we understand the attributes of Allah? And this uh, Christian controversy became an Islamic one. And instead of talking about Jesus Christ, it started talking about the speech of Allah and the attributes of Allah and hundreds and hundreds of different theologians came back to this verse so that we can continue verse number 11. Allah says, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ there is nothing whatsoever like him. Laysa kamithli. The kaf here is for emphasis. The kaf here does not need to be the linguistically. You could say laysa mithlahu shay. You could say that. But the kaf here, it adds an extra punch or oomph. Laysa kamithli shay. There is nothing whatsoever that is like unto him. Wa huwa sami'ul basir. And he is the one who hears and the one who sees. And again, so much can be said. I will simply summarize for you what the verse says, and then it's up to you to go beyond this. Allah is saying there is nothing whatsoever that resembles Him, nothing. So anything you imagine, not that you should imagine Allah, you are wrong. Anything you try to visualize, anything that you think you understand exactly, you and your mind will never fully comprehend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Laysa kamithlihi shay. He is absolutely unique in every fashion and manner and attribute and name. And then, when Allah Azza wa Jal negates from Himself being anything like the creation, He then affirms the two most common names and attributes that are found in every single or almost every single living organism. And that is Samir and Basir. Every animal is Samir and Basir in some sense. And Allah says, there is nothing like unto me and I am the one who hears and sees. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention the two most common attributes in all of the creation? To underscore that just because the same word is used, I hear and see and Allah is as Sami' and Al-Basir. There is no similarity between my hearing and seeing and between the hearing and seeing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We understand what the word means. I understand what it is to hear and to see, but how Allah hears and sees is beyond my comprehension. This is the simple understanding that we derive straight from the verse, use it for every single other attribute and leave it at that. We understand what the word means. We will never understand how it exists in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That in a nutshell solves all of this controversy straight from the Quran. Another key theological verse uh, in Surah Ashura is verse number 30. مَا أَصَابَكُمْ بِمُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُ عَنْ كَثِيرٍ Verse number 30, whatever musiba happens to you, whatever pain, suffering, calamity happens to you, it is because of what your own hands have done and through it, Allah forgives plenty. So this is the verse that shows us that evil does happen and that at some level it is what we ourselves have done and that if we are patient, that evil will be a mechanism of having our sins forgiven and not just equivalent to that pain and suffering. A small evil, a small pain, so much so our Prophet said a thorn that pricks the believer, the smallest of irritations and nuisances Instances, if we exhibit proper decorum and proper iman and turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask for forgiveness, if we understand that all that is happening is happening for a wisdom and a plan, and we understand that we are makhluq and Allah is khaliq, that's all that needs to be done. Allah is in charge and I turn to Allah to help me. If we have this attitude, then all of this irritations, nuisance, Allah will use it to forgive all of the sins, many sins that we have done. وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٍ Then the surah concludes which is also a theological point, verse 51. It is not possible for any human that Allah should speak to him directly. Not possible. No human Allah has spoken to directly, except illa wahyan, except by wahi. Jibreel comes and inspires, or the wahi can be via a dream, or the wahi can be through other means, but not seeing Allah. Awmin wara'a hijabin, or from behind a veil. The Prophet spoke to Allah from behind a veil. Musa spoke to Allah from behind a veil. Aw yursila rasulan, or another messenger will come and uh, reveal to him whatever Allah Azza wa wills. He is indeed Ali. He is indeed the All uh, Mighty and the All uh, Wise. And these are uh, three types of main inspiration that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala inspires 
inquires directly into the servant, this is the Prophet, or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks from behind a curtain, or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the angel uh, Jibreel. No human has ever seen Allah directly. That's not going to happen in this world. It is a blessing for the next world. And that's why verse 52 concludes this surah, وَكَذَلِكَ This is how we have inspired you by our command. You did not know, O Messenger of Allah, what the kitab was, what the scripture was. You did not know what the book was, nor did you know what iman was. You didn't know the details of the kitab or the iman. Ya Rasulullah, you were a good man living in Mecca for 40 years. You were upright and pious in your own way, but you did not know the Quran before we sent it down to you. You did not know the realities of iman and all of the pillars of iman and the all. what does it mean to have all of this iman until we made it a light. Allah says we called it a, a, a nur. We re reveal to you a light that we guide whomever we wish of our servants. And indeed, you are the one who guides to the straight uh, path. So the Prophet is the one guiding us to the path and Allah guided him to that path. He is our leader in our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next surah is Surah Zukhruf, similar length, around seven pages, 89 verses. And Zukhruf translates as golden decoration pieces. And it is called this because of verse 35, as we will come to. And the main theme of Surah Zukhruf is to prove the Quranic message and to refute criticisms leveled against both the message and the uh, messenger. And like all of the Hawamim surahs, the surah begins by describing the Quran. Verse number three, that we have revealed this inna anzalna Quran arabiyan la'allakum ta'qilun. We have revealed this Quran to you uh, in Arabic so that you can understand it. And Allah Azza wa Jal also mentions one of the main arguments that those who rejected Allah use. Verse 29, verse 20, excuse me, that وَقَالُوا لَوْ شَاءَ الرَّحْمَانُ مَا عَبَدْنَاهُمْ The pagans say, if Allah had willed, we would not be worshipping these gods. So the fact that we are worshipping these gods is an indication that Allah has willed it. And if Allah has willed it, this means Allah is pleased with it. Then Allah says, وَمَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمٍ They have no knowledge of what they are saying. Rather, they are merely spouting guesses. This is uneducated rabble. This is just stuff that doesn't have academic merit. Now, this is a very deep theological verse as well. Why? Because one of the common tactics that is still used, very common in our times, is the claim that just because something exists, this is a proof that Allah indeed is pleased with it. The existence of something indicates according to them, Allah's approval of it. And this is the exact same argument that was used by the pagans when they worshiped the idols, and it is used today by many groups as well. It's not my fault if I desire something. It's not my fault if I am attracted to something. It's not my fault if I have inclinations that are whatever they might be. God created me in this way, and therefore God must love me, and therefore God approves of my desires and my lifestyle. And what does the Quran say? No. You have no knowledge about what you are talking about. Just because an urge exists doesn't mean the urge is loved by Allah. We have to differentiate between Allah's creation and Allah's approval. Indeed, everything is created by Allah at some level. True, but Allah Azza wa Jal only loves certain things and He has told us what He loves. So we we are the creation of Allah and we have to channel our urges. We have to channel as much as we can of our creation and what we have to be amongst the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a very key verse that just because something exists doesn't mean that Allah Azza wa Jal loves it. We have to make uh, ourselves into that category that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Also in Surah Zukhruf is the famous verse, verse 13 and 14, the famous dua that we say when we start a journey. That Allah says, when you ride on any animal, uh, you, rem you should remember the blessings that Allah has given you, and uh, you should say, Subhan alladhi sakhara lana hadha, wa ma kunna lahu muqrinin, wa inna ila rabbina lamunqalibun. That glory be to Allah, who has placed these animals at our service, and we would never have been able to do this ourselves, and indeed, we will be going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we say the same, whatever uh, vehicle that we have, whether it is a car, whether it is anything, we thank Allah for having given us the dominion, having given us that power to have these mechanisms or these animals, whatever it is, and we thank Allah for those um, blessings. Also, just like the previous surah, this surah as well, we are reminded 
that Allah is the one who is in charge of deciding who gets what, and He knows who to give to. Verse 32, that Allah says, أَهُمْ يَقْسِمُونَ رَحْمَةَ رَبِّكْ Are they in charge of dividing Allah's mercy amongst mankind? Who put you in charge of deciding who should get how much? نَحْنُ قَسَمْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ مَعِيشَتَهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا This is a very, very interesting verse from a sociological and an anthropological perspective. Allah is saying, we are the ones who have allocated their livelihoods and their careers. Ma'isha is livelihood and career. We are the ones who have allocated their ma'isha, how they're going to live, how they're going to earn in this lifetime. وَرَفَعْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ فَوْقَ بَعْضٍ دَرَجَاتٍ and we have lifted some people above others in ranks. Why? So that groups amongst them would have to take the services of other groups. But the rahma of your Lord is far better than anything of this world that they can amass. This verse is one of the most profound verses when it comes to uh, different levels of society and different careers and different choices and how society functions together. What we are being told in a beautiful way that only Allah can say is that each one of us, first and foremost, Allah Azza wa Jal has allocated the risk and the wealth and at, uh, obviously our career choices as well. Allah Azza wa Jal knows what we're going to do and every single person amongst us, we have something we can give and something we need from others. We, even the wealthiest person who might even be a multi-billionaire, whatever, that person still needs to hire people and use their talents. That person needs to hire hundreds of people to do the services. Those people that are hired, they need the wealth of the multi-billionaire. Both the worker and the multi-billionaire, they need the farmer for the food that they eat. Both, all three, the farmer and all of them, they need the doctor. All of them need the servicemen for their cars, so on and so forth. So every single group of people, every single profession, it needs other professions as well. And that's what Allah is saying, لِيَتَّخِذَ بَعْضُهُمْ بَعْضًا سُخْرِيَّةً Each one of them will take others for employment. So Allah is saying, I created it this way. This diversity that you have, this is from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah reminds us, Indeed, some of you will have more than others. But all of this is irrelevant because This world means nothing. It is the mercy of Allah that is infinitely better than all that they can possibly have in this world. And therefore, whatever your socioeconomic rank might be in this world, it is irrelevant for the actual rank because it doesn't matter where you are in this dunya, the rahmah of Allah Azza wa Jal and how to get there has nothing to do with your bank account, with what you have. In fact, to be brutally honest, the more you have, the potentially more difficult it is to earn Jannah because you'll have more distractions of this world. So Allah Azza wa mentions this reality about uh, this world. And then in the next verse, Allah mentions, and this is a, a bit of a deep verse here that you need to read multiple times, that Allah mentions that if He wanted to, He would have given those who reject Him, He would have given the kuffar, palaces of silver roofs and dazzling staircases, and He would have decorated them with gold ornaments. But if He did that, then most of mankind would have chosen that path. And all of this is nothing but temporary pleasures of this world and the hereafter with your Lord is far better for those who are pious. This verse uh, indicates that this world means nothing to Allah. If Allah had wanted to, He could have made every single one who rejected Him, He could have given him all that He could have desired, an entire palace made out of precious metals, inside of which are going to be staircases made out of precious metals, inside of which their decorations and chandeliers will be made out of gold. Allah is saying, one, one interpretation is that, Allah is saying this world means nothing, and if Allah had wanted to, He would have given the kuffar all of this. But then if He had done that, the people who are, are desiring Allah, they might have been tempted. They might have said, hey, I want that too. And so Allah Azza wa is saying, it's actually a mercy that I haven't done even this, even though He's saying, I don't care about this world, and I could have done all of this for them, it would not have affected me in the uh, slightest. Uh, this surah as well, by the way, it mentions uh, some of the stories of Ibrahim and Musa and Isa. And what's very important about this surah, verse number 57 onwards, take a look at it. 
It is the most explicit reference in the entire Quran to the second coming of Jesus Christ. We mainstream Muslims, this is something that is mentioned in many of our uh, treatises and textbooks, and it is something that is explicitly affirmed in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Quran is indirect, it is not explicit, it is indirect. And this verse is explicitly indirect, let me put it that way, right? And it's very clear, but at the same time, you have to read in, in the context. And verse 57 onwards, uh, Allah Azza wa Jalla is mentioning the story of Isa. And whenever Isa is mentioned, the kuffar of the Quraysh make fun of him, say, who is Isa? Our gods are better than Jesus Christ. And Allah says, in huwa illa abdun, Isa was a noble servant. We blessed him, we made him a role model for the children of Israel. And then verse 61, وَإِنَّهُ لَعِلْمُ لِلسَّاعَةِ And he, Jesus, is a sign of the day of judgment. So have no doubt about it and follow me. That is the straight way. How can Jesus be the sign of the day of judgment? Our scholars have interpreted that, of course, what is meant here, the return of Jesus is the sign of the day of judgment. Allah is talking about Jesus, and then Allah says, Jesus is going to be the sign of the day of judgment. So we also as Muslims believe that Isa ibn Maryam is going to come back, and he will establish the sharia of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he will fight against the Dajjal, and he will have many followers, and he will be successful, and then he will uh, precede the actual uh, uh, blowing of the trumpet, but obviously other things will happen as well. So this verse indicates the second coming of Isa ibn Maryam. And this surah concludes with terrifying descriptions of the day of judgment. Verse 67. المتقين, on the day of judgment. The best of friends. They will be the worst of enemies, except for the people of taqwa. Think about this verse your best friends, those whom you would give your life for, those whom you help unhesitatingly on the day of judgment. If the both of you do not have iman and taqwa, you haven't helped one another in iman and taqwa, you will be suing each other in the court of Allah. Each one will come with grievances that, oh Allah, this person misled me. Oh Allah, this person tempted me. Oh Allah, this person led me astray. Oh Allah, this person told me to do this and this. And this person did this wrong and that wrong. Everybody is gonna be, you know, the worst of enemies because they're gonna try to save themselves by blaming other people. But one category will be safe and that is, المتقين, the righteous, the people of taqwa, the people who truly have faith in Allah, their friendship that was based from Allah, for Allah, upon the sharia of Allah, their Islamic brotherhood, that will be a blessing for them on the day of judgment. And they're not going to be enemies on the day of judgment, they will be friends in judgment, and they will be friends inshallah ta'ala in Jannah as well. So choose your friends that will accompany you all the way up there. And don't choose friends that will become your worst enemies because you were of no religious benefit. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, a person follows the religion of his close friends. So see who your closest friends are. Now again, we're talking about close friends, acquaintances and colleagues are different and you do not choose those. We're talking about those whom you choose to have a deep uh, association and friendship with. Choose people of piety so that you can be with them in this world and in the next world. And the surah then uh, concludes with terrifying descriptions of uh, uh, the, the, the day of judgment and also of Jahannam. And of course, beautiful descriptions of Jannah. Verse 68, Ya ibadi, O my servants, la khawfun alikum al yawma wa la antum tahzanun. You have nothing to fear, nor shall you worry. Udkhulul jannata antum wa azwajukum tuhbarun. Enter Jannah, you and your spouses joyfully. Yutafu alayhim bi sahafin. They will be served. There's going to be servants in Jannah. You don't have to pick up the glass. The glass will be brought to you with trays of gold and cups of gold. And in Jannah is that that whatever the souls desire and whatever delights the eyes. And you shall be in there forever and ever and ever. And Allah says, and this is the Jannah, you inherited it because of your actions. Your actions caused you to earn this Jannah. So let every person see, have they actually done something that will bring about that inheritance? We want to inherit Jannah. So we better act in order to get that 
Jannah. Of course, in this surah as well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions uh, one of the uh, most terrifying aspects of Jahannam, and that is that the people of Jahannam are begging the angel of Jahannam, whose name is Malik, verse 77, وَقَالُوا يَا مَالِكُ وَنَادُوا يَا مَالِكُ And they call out, يَا مَالِكُ اِقْضِ عَلَيْنَا رَبُّكُ Have your Lord destroy us. We just want to end this thing. So they're making nida to Malik. They're calling out to the angel who is the guardian of hell. They're calling out to this angel and they're saying, Oh Malik, just ask Allah to finish all of us. And Malik will say, respond to them, you are staying here. This is going to be your forever abode. We came to you with truth, but most of you, you hated the truth. And the surah ends with instructions on how to respond to those who mock Islam and those who mock religiosity. Verse 89, pardon them عنهم, and say salam, peace, and they shall eventually come to know. Pardon them and say peace and they will come to know. It's not your job to pretend to be Malik. It's not your job to pretend to be the adab of Allah. That's leave it for the Akhirah. Your job is not the judgment. Your job is to preach and treat them nicely. Leave all of this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next surah, Surah Dukhan. Surah Al-Dukhan is a relatively short surah, only three pages. It's a 59 uh, verses. And Dukhan means a dusty cloud. And it is called Dukhan because in uh, this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that one of the signs of the Day of Judgment, يَوْمَ تَأْتِ السَّمَاءُ بِدُخَانٍ مُّبِينٍ That on the, uh, a day will come when the skies will be clouded with a massive cloud. And this is a uh, one of the signs of Judgment Day, a great cloud of smoke will envelop the earth. We ask Allah for His protection and uh, safety. And the main theme of Surah Al-Dukhan is to threaten those who reject the Day of Judgment and to try to make them repent before it is too late. And Surah Al-Dukhan is one of the two surahs in the Quran that explicitly mentions Laylatul Qadr. And of course, we are doing this series in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. These are the nights of Laylatul Qadr. And so make sure that you are doing extra worship. In Surah Al-Dukhan verse 3, Inna anzannahu fi laylatin mubarakatin, that we have revealed it on a blessed night. Verse number four, فِيهَا يُفْرَقُ كُلُّ أَمْرٍ حَكِيمٍ On this night, every single wise command, it is decided and distinguished. So Allah calls Laylatul Qadr, Layla Mubarakah. And what a beautiful description, because what is Mubarak? What does Baraka mean? Mubarak means that something small, it is manifested in a much larger manner. Something that is trivial becomes magnificent. A small quantity, it is as if it becomes a large quantity. And of course, the classic example, when our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made dua, one cup of milk, which would typically feed one person, it fed over a hundred and some reports over a thousand people. They kept on drinking from that cup of milk. That is what you call barakah. A small amount is, is much larger than it actually looks. And so Allah is calling the Laylatul Qadr a blessed night. You do ibadah for one night and you get the reward for a thousand months. There is no night that is more blessed than the Laylatul Qadr. So those of you that are watching in the month of Ramadan, make sure that you exert yourselves in these last nights and especially on the uh, odd nights. By the way, some um, folkloric interpretations say that this verse applies to the 15th of Sha'ban. That is just simply false. There is no academic basis to this because Allah says, we have sent the Quran down on this night and it is a blessed night. So this is Laylatul Qadr, uh, not the 15th of uh, Sha'ban. In verse number nine, Allah describes uh, those who are rejecting Islam uh, as uh, that they are uh, um, uh, playing around يلعبون, that they are playing around in their doubts that those who reject Islam they have doubts and they're playing around with that doubt and this is again the reality of those who reject Allah and religiosity, if you look at their arguments, they're simply in a echo chamber. Each one is saying the same thing to validate the other person, the other person feels validated by the other one, and they keep on saying the exact same things, literally as the Quran describes, that they're playing around with their doubts, like a ball passed between each other, and their doubts then validate their own understanding, and they are happy in this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns them multiple times in this surah. Uh, of them, of course, we mentioned verse Number 10, uh, just wait, wait in your doubts until that comes, the, the Dukhan, which is the end of times. Verse 34, 
that inna haula la yaqulun, these people say, there is nothing but our death and we're never going to be resurrected. And they challenge, bring our ancestors back if you are truthful. And of course, there are many people who don't believe in life after death. To this day, large segments of mankind, they, they simply say, let's just, uh, uh, the famous phrase, YOLO, you only live once. No, you don't live once, you live twice. قَالُوا رَبَّنَا أَمَتَّنَا اثْنَتَيْنِ وَحِيدَنَا اثْنَتَيْنِ This is in the Quran, oh Allah, you gave us life twice and death twice. You live twice, not once. This is our first life, and we shall have another life after this. Verse number 40. In the Yawm al-Fasli, Miqatum Ajma'in. The day of sorting out shall be their appointed time frame. On that day, no friend will help any other friend, and they will find no help externally as well. So the surah challenges those who reject the day of judgment in a very, very specific manner. It takes them on and asks them very pointed questions and explains to them that indeed there will be a day of judgment. Uh, we also have in the surah, the story of Musa and Fir'aun. And again, we have a different twist. Every time we have the same story, there's this different you know, subplot or theme that can be derived. And in this one, one of the main themes is very clear, and that is all of the might of the Pharaoh, all of the power of the Pharaoh, and his people, the great civilization, which to this day is considered to be one of the highest civilizations that mankind has ever known. The civilization that built the pyramids, the ancient e Egyptians, this is to this day folkloric. And Allah Azza wa mentions, so what? What happened to them? Where did they go? In verse 25 onwards, very powerful as usual, the Quran, كَمْ تَرَكُوا مِنْ جَنَّاتٍ وَعُيُونَ How many gardens and fountains did they leave behind? وَزُرُوعٍ And plantations, وَمَقَامٍ كَرِيمٍ Beautiful, magnificent buildings and palaces, وَنِعْمَةٍ كَانُوا فِيهَا فَاكِهِينَ And comforts, and they used to enjoy all of these amenities, the entire civilization of Egypt. Where is it now? What has happened to it? كَذَلِكَ So, we caused another group to take all of that civilization. SubhanAllah, once again, the, the simple attitude or the simple way that the harshness of only Allah can speak like this. Kadalik, so it was. What happened to all of that? So it was. And another civilization came and they took over the same area and the same land. And then Allah says, فَمَا بَكَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّمَاءُ وَالْأَرْضِ Neither the heavens nor the earth wept when they left, nor were they given any second chance, subhanAllah. When we leave, we want the creation of Allah to miss us. We want our loved ones. We want even uh, the, the, the angels on this earth. We want the, uh, the, the, the other um, entities on this earth. We want them to mourn for us. As our Prophet Sallallahu said, the one who is teaching uh, people good, every entity in the creation asks Allah for forgiveness for this person. Even the ant and even the fish, they ask Allah to teach the one who is Mu'allim al-Khair, teaching mankind good, may Allah make us amongst them. So the creation of Allah sympathizes with the righteous of Allah. And as for Fir'aun, Allah is saying when he left, there was no one that cried over. They were happy to see him go. So we do not want the creation of Allah to rejoice when we go. Rather, we want them to make praying for us and we want to be happy in this world and in the next world. And the surah concludes with some powerful imagery about both the punishments of Jahannam and the blessings of uh, Jannah. Verse uh, 56 that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the people of Jannah, they shall never taste death in Jannah because they've already tasted it in this world. And وَوَقَاهُمْ عَذَابَ الْجَحِيمِ And He will protect the people of Jannah from the punishment of Jahannam. فَضْلًا مِّنْ رَبِّكْ It is a blessing from Allah and that is indeed the supreme salvation. فَإِنَّمَا يَسَّرْنَاهُ بِلِسَانِكَ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَذَكَّرُونَ فَارْتَقِبْ إِنَّهُمْ مُرْتَقِبُونَ So we made the Quran easy for you so that they can understand and remember it. So you wait and let them wait as well for the day of judgment. Notice the very similar motifs of all of these surahs, that especially in the ending, the Muslims are being told, okay, look, they have done very evil, uh, great evil in rejecting Allah. But in the end of the day, it's not your job to treat them in any manner of harshness. Let them do what they're doing. And you wait, and they too will wait for the day of judgment. And this is a common theme, uh, especially of these Meccan surahs, and we, will do, we would do good 
to take the lesson from this and apply it in the realities that we live in. The Quranic language is very harsh towards those who reject Allah, but Allah does not tell us to be harsh towards those who reject Him. It's not our job. Those who reject Him and let us be who we are, we're not talking about those who persecute. We're not talking about those who kill. We're talking about those who are arrogant and walk away. Allah says, you also say salam and let them do what they're doing. If they want to live their life in whatever fashion, your job is to be a positive role model. Your job is to show mercy and compassion and you leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a very, very clear message from the Quran. Allah has every right to be harsh to those who reject Him. And the Quran's language is very clear, but that harshness should not translate on how me and you interact with those people. Even as we debate, even as we discuss, even as we explain to them why they're wrong in the end of the day, so many verses, you let them wait, you turn away from them, you forgive, you do what you're doing and let them do what they're doing and Allah will be the judge. And this is the same message we get in the final surah that we're going to do today and that is Surah uh, Al-Jathiyah. And Surah Al-Jathiyah as well is a relatively short surah, only three and a half pages and it is 37 verses. And this surah, one of the main themes is to establish the importance of the Qur'an and to clarify different types of evidences against those who reject the Qur'an. The word jathiyah means kneeling down because there is an explicit reference uh, in this surah about all of the nations and ummas being kneeling in front of Allah on the day of judgment. And so the word jathiyah is used, uh, which means they're all gonna be kneeling down. And so that's why the surah is called jathiyah. As with all of the hawamim surahs, without exception, Surah Al-Jathiyah begins by listing the blessings of Allah and listing the mechanism of how Allah has dominion over the entire creation before criticizing those uh, who have rejected and those who don't listen to these signs or see these signs. And then once again, Allah explicitly says how to deal with those rejectors. Listen to this verse. Can you get more explicit than this? Verse number 14 of Jathiyah. That those who believe, tell them to forgive those who have no hope for the coming kingdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah azza wa jal will fully recompense them for all that they have earned. مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلِنَفْسِهِ وَمَنْ أَسَاءَ فَعَلَيْهَا ثُمَّ إِلَى رَبِّكُمْ تُرْجَعُونَ Whoever does a good deed, it is for himself. Whoever commits an evil, it will be against him. Then all of you shall go back to Allah. Read this verse carefully. Verse number 14. Tell those to, who believe, to forgive those who do not hope for Allah's kingdom in the next life. In this world, it's not our job to judge. It's not our job to act Billah like many gods giving them the punishment. No, that's up to Allah and He has every right. He is the Malikul Mulk. He is the one who will be Maliki Yawmiddin. And this is the clear message that we learn from all of these Hawamim surahs. And this is again, yet another example. Then what follows is one of the most interesting verses that deals with the moral argument for believing in the day of judgment. It is not the only time uh, that it exists in the Quran, this moral argument, but verse 21 of Jathiyah is uh, perhaps one of the most explicit when it comes to proving that there shall be an afterlife based on the moral concept of justice. Verse number 21, that Allah says that uh, did those who ijtarahu sayyat who continue to perpetuate evil deeds, did they think that we would make them the same as those who were good and believed, regardless in life and in death, how evil is their judgment. Allah created the heavens and earth with haqq. And haq here means there is truth, there is ultimate truth, there is ultimate justice, there's ultimate wisdom. And so every soul, Allah says, will be repaid for what it has earned and they will not be wronged. So verse 21, to rephrase this argument in simple English, Allah is saying, do you think it's fair that Allah Azza wa Jal would allow the criminal 
to get away with his criminal lifestyle and the believer who struggled and was pious and maintained his good manners and never did anything wrong and then they both live and die and the criminal lives a good life outwardly. The criminal seems to be having uh, pleasure in this world and doing whatever, whereas the righteous is struggling and getting by. Allah says, do you think that those two are the same? Their life and their death are equally the same? No, what a foolish uh, presumption to make. Allah created this world with ultimate truth and justice. So the fact that there is no justice in this world that is ultimate is an automatic indication that there shall be a day of justice, a day of judgment, because Allah Azza wa Jal will not allow injustice to go unpunished, nor will He allow piety to go unrewarded. How many are the evil tyrants that have lived and continue to live and they seem to get by, even though internally they might be struggling and whatnot, but externally they have might and power and wealth. And how many Many are the poor, innocent souls that have been tortured to death, killed, thrown into jails. How many whose rights has been trampled and they don't get justice in this world? Not just tyrants. Every one of us, we've had people in our lives that do wrong unto us. We cannot get our rights back from them. So Allah is saying, do you think that's fair? No, this world has, was created with truth and there shall be a day that every person shall be repaid for what it has been done, uh, what it has done, and no wrong will be shown to it. And in this surah as well, we are especially told to be careful of one of the worst of all evils. Verse number 23, have you not seen the one who has taken his own desires as his object of worship? And Allah has knowingly led him astray, put a seal on his hearing and his heart, put a veil over his vision. Who will guide this person after Allah? Will you not reflect? anyone who follows whatever he desires, it is as if he has worshiped himself instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyone who opens unchecked every lust, every passion, every caprice, every whim, this person has worshiped himself and his desires. And Allah says, have you not seen this man who has taken his own desires and lusts as his ultimate God? The halal is what he desires, the haram is what he doesn't want. That person, Allah says, I have led him astray upon knowledge. Knowingly, this person doesn't deserve to be uh, guided. And the surah concludes by mentioning uh, the day of judgment, verse 27. To Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and earth and the day that the judgment takes place, on that day the falsifiers will lose and you will see every community on its knees. Every community will be called to its book. Today you will be repaid for all that you used to do. This book of ours, the book here is the scroll of deeds. This book of ours will speak about you in truth. Verily, we would write down all that you used to do. And this surah concludes with a powerful praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is no conclusion for our episode better than these two verses that we're gonna conclude with. And that is Allah Azza wa Jalla saying verse number 36, that praise belongs to Allah. الحمد رب السماوات ورب الأرض رب العالمين to Allah belongs the praise the Lord of the heavens the Lord of the earth and the Lord of all of humanity وله الكبرياء في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم to him belongs all supremacy in the heavens and earth and he is indeed the majestic and the all wise inshallah taala we'll continue tomorrow with our next uh, section until then السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أجبت دعاء نوح فانتصر وحملته في فلكك المشحون يا من أحال النار حول خليله روحا وريحانا بقولك كون